Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Dr. Lori Moore. Welcome, Lori. Hi, good to be here. <clears throat> um, Lori, among other things, is an animal communicator, and so we're going to be talking about that a bit. And uh, it's funny, in the last week, I've had these serendipitous animal communicator type experiences, uh, you know, because I was thinking about this interview and I was thinking, well, does this really fit into the theme of this show and, and uh, you know, having sort of skeptical thoughts. And then last Sunday I was at a potluck dinner and I was sitting talking to a good friend of mine who's been a friend for a dozen years and she told me she was an animal communicator. I didn't know any, I had no idea. And we talked for about an hour and I asked her all sorts of questions and it, it really kind of deepened my understanding of the whole thing. Um, and then just like yesterday, I opened up an email from a friend who happens to live in an ashram in the Himalayas who actually gets down to civilization once in a while and sends me emails. And he sent me this, uh, sent me this thing about this guy in Africa who uh, rescued traumatized elephants that were otherwise going to have to be shot. And he, he managed to communicate with them in such a way as to convince them that they were going to be safer just staying in this protective area that they had set up and they shouldn't try to escape. And he formed this real bond with them. With them. And then he, uh, he died unexpectedly last March of a heart attack in the middle of the night. And all these elephants came from miles and miles away, you know, to be near where he had died and, and everyone was amazed because how did the elephants know he had died you know um, and then there was one other email this guy sent me about this this Indian fellow named uh, Balraj Maharshi who um, was a able to talk to plants and he was he became a, this incredible herbal expert where he would walk through the forest and he'd see some plant and the plant would actually tell him what it was good for and what its medicinal uses were and, and so on so it was sort of like nature was organizing to educate me a little bit more during the past week <laughs> by bringing these things to my attention. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Beautiful how that happens so synchronistically and you know the animals and the plants and the people who are more tuned in to the language of the universal heart will find that that's a natural kind of flow that we're communicating with each other all the time and the way humans have been limited to our intellect to think that we can separate what our mind says is happening from the whole reality of what is happening is really just a trick. It's a device of the mind that separates us from this oneness. And the, to speak to an animal or a plant, it's necessary that one drops into the heart and drops into the arena in which really there is no separation between me and the cat I'm speaking to. May I just say I want to introduce you to animal number one here. <laughs> There's three of them around here, but he happens to be handy. <laughs> and who is this? This is, this is Nikos. Hi, Nikos. Uh-huh. And, uh... He was, he was left in a roadside recycling bin covered with fleas, and uh, that we ended up getting him, getting rid of the fleas. <laughs> well, he still has some, but <laughs> it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. <laughs> I'm sorry, so I, I sort of interrupted you, but you were actually doing what I was going to ask you to, to begin to do at the beginning of this interview, which is to put this in a context of spirituality, because I know that some people who watch this show are going to say, all right, fine, animal communicating, but what does that have to do with awakening or realization and all, which is yeah. the, the main theme of your show? So yes. let's, let's talk about that just a little bit more, okay? Yeah, like what does the Bible have to do with Jesus, and what is what everyone thinks Jesus and Buddha said have to do with anything? But along those lines, what I'm saying by that statement is that when we drop more deeply into the reality of our hearts, mm -hmm. we begin to communicate with the universe beyond the dogma of what is spiritual and what is not spiritual, <laughs> and we begin to really experience that which people like to discuss as a as a mental exercise, and it's completely lost then, you know. So, so um, what is you know, what do animals have to do with the plants and what do plants have to do with the oneness and what does that have to do with nothing? <laughs> what it has to do with nothing and which is everything truly is that when we drop deep into the silence, deep into the stillness, and, and the mind can keep going. Mm -hmm. Words can float around that. It, it's an illusion that all words will forever go. Words are a tool. They come to serve in this instance. I use words to deliver water. I use words to connect with you. But there's something else deeper than that 
that gives rise to all this, and the animals are in touch with that, that complete space, that complete silence. Out of that they speak, out of that they feel someone has died. Elephants go miles to visit their loved one. Oh, a tsunami's hitting. We all know they go up above the tsunami and are saved. And why didn't the humans know? When we tune deeper into what really is here, what we are a vessel for, we find there's just one source, one something. To me, it's, it's, it's a light that propels everything. It's not separate from me or you. It's coming right through my heart. And my experience of the animals all species of animals is that's just an inherent awareness they live in mm -hmm. so it when people call me to speak to an animal what they're really calling me about is to go deeper first into some quality the animal calls forth in them maybe it's compassion or laughter or joy and then with some nudging to go a little deeper into what is propelling that what is at the base of that what is here out of which all this gets created mm. yeah I mean, when you speak of oneness and, you know, a deeper reality and all, that's what all the spiritual people these days are talking about. They just don't usually bring animals into the picture. But, but what you're kind of saying, I suppose, is that the animals can be both an example and perhaps even a technique for um, tuning into that more deeply. I would say the, the animals are our partners in community. The animals are our partners in society. And when we approach them with love, it's not so much there a tool or a technique for us, but what we approach with love can bring us back to this. Oneness has become a very abstract term, but when we fall into that oneness, it's a deep falling into love, and it's mm -hmm. a falling into love with all the waves that are moving through me now. Emotions move through me, physical sensations move through me, and you and everyone else, and yours move through mine, and mine move through yours, and thoughts move through, but in the center of all that is just this, uh, I can't even give it a word. And in order to speak to animals, our brothers and sisters, we have to drop into that. Mm. Uh, I remember at a seminar, a, some people were swimming, like chasing dolphins. Well, of course, dolphins can swim much faster than people. <laughs> you know, Dolphins have free will. They get to decide who they swim with. And so I took everyone out of the water and I said, let's do an exercise with a horse first. And we went back on land and we met a horse named Decor there, who we had been in communication with. And I asked people to communicate with this horse. And a woman was telling the horse all of her psychological uh, New Age problems in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, oh, a theoretical basis, which I think is valuable. My background is as a psychotherapist, my PhD is in psychology, so I value that as a system, as an outward way of connecting, but it doesn't get to the heart of things. So of course when she spoke to the horse, and it's on film, it's in, in my video, in a miracles, the horse is going <laughs> <laughs> and running away, and finally she got it, finally I just kept asking her, what's really in your heart? Finally she spoke to the horse from her heart with just a few, only a few words were needed. And then the horse came up and was loving and kissing mm. and just reaffirming this simplicity, this place where this abstract oneness, I promise you people, people think it's just a term or it's a mind game. There is a place in your heart that knows an experience where all is one connected. And, and when you start to live your life from that, you respond to that. It's a very, very different, it's fulfilling, it's full of joy, it's not based on circumstantials. Uh, your experience is, is rising up like a wave over and over and over. And you fall in love with that, but that's just the experience. Something deeper is what carries you. Mm. So it, it, it's, a, it's a great creative experience to put into words something that's so vast and so full and really can't be fully explained with words, but we're human. And so that's what we're doing here. We're, we're using articulation playfully to bring this, to bring this awareness. So the energy hopefully comes through and the words assist with people that like to think, like myself. Sure. Um, well, there's plenty of things in life that can't be explained by words. I mean, try explaining the color red. You know, every, every, if you, anybody who's not colorblind knows what red is, but only because we have an agreed upon thing, you can't actually describe it unless you want to get into like in the number of you know cycles per second of that particular part of the electromagnetic spectrum and some blah blah blah. But you know, it's basically it's 
there are a million things, the taste of an orange, so many things that most of the things we experience can't really be described in words. We're, we've just kind of got these agreed upon symbols that yeah. we, we kind of all say, okay, this symbol is going to correlate with that and so on. What a great analogy, because of course we can't really know red other than our experience of it, and yet we have many ways to describe it, scientifically, mm -hmm. poetically, artistically. What mm -hmm. a perfect analogy. And I do feel strongly by stepping into the realities of different animals and people, and that's how I speak to the animals. I just give my heart to theirs, so for that moment, I feel their feelings, I see their pictures, I hear their thoughts. and. I, I was trained to do that by people because I sat with people for so many years as psychotherapists. They would come in and give me long intellectual stories. And when I listened much deeper and learned to really help them, it was listening way deeper than what they were, they were claiming was true. So what I'm getting at here is that each of us has experienced the universe very differently. And my guess is if you or I got to sit in the eyes of 10 different people, even red, even the color red would be slightly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and not only you know fairly non emotionally charged things like red, but you 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 know <laughs> sit in different people's eyes and look at how politics looks or gun control or abortion <laughs> or you know, any these other issues that we're also crazy about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. All realities created around different, not just one person system, but we we live in a world where everywhere you go, there's another dream, another reality, group mm. dreams, individual dreams. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but it, in the third chapter of the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali, which are, is an ancient book all about yoga, um, he, he itemizes a number of siddhis or perfections which are said to develop um, at a certain stage of one's spiritual growth. And understanding the language of the animals is one of them. Well, understanding creation and understanding surrender are two very important layers of spiritual growth if we systematize it. Some people just live their life and experience, but, but some people like to put things into categories, and I'm for either way. Every being is different. But when we look at the level of creation and surrender, animals are very involved in that. So hearing them, feeling them, and seeing them is indication that we are more involved in surrender that surrender when we we give ourselves to what is occurring beyond a desire to manage it control it create it or change it. it's very vast the mysterious the mysterious beauty and just the love that comes through that just letting the heart merge into all is quite quite glorious and then the act of creation because we live on a planet that gives us opportunity every day to participate in the artistry of what's happening here. We're not victims, we're all artists. And so the animals of all species, air animals, land animals, um, all animals, sea animals, are very, very skilled at that. So stepping into either of those layers would, would pretty much open up an ability to communicate with animals. Yeah, I, I suppose the the key question is how does one step into those layers and of course there are many techniques and practices and meditation things and teachers and everybody you know there's ancient traditions all around the world of even even various kinds of drugs I mean people have been trying to step into those layers as you put it uh, throughout history and uh, some approaches are quite systematic some seem to be quite spontaneous there'll be somebody who's never been interested in such things and they are walking across the street and all of a sudden you know some deep profound realization opens up for them but i think for the average person when they hear talks like this or or begin to acquire an interest in spiritual development they want to know well you know what can i actually do you know cuz yes. i'm busy i'm stressed <laughs> out you know how i mean can I be uh, here now how, yeah how can how can this shift else? from just being a lot of talk <laughs> To, to an actual experience, you know? Yes, I, I'm busy, I can't be here now, and I need to visualize where I'm going to be later. But how you can be here now, <laughs> thank you Ram Dass, long ago, for what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about is, yes, I'm for every single technique, if that's what draws you, I'm for every single teacher, if that's what draws you, everyone go where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And I invite you to step so fully 
into the experience your heart is providing right now as your individual self is also providing experience. It's, it's giving you an emotion, a sensation, and a thought. And if you can step fully, if you can let your cells, your muscles, the blood in your body be completely relaxed into that right here, it does become so simple. It really does. It becomes so simple that spontaneous little awakenings or a big experience, it doesn't matter. It will happen in your way. And see, your way isn't going to happen how Buddha happened, how Jesus happened, how Mary it happened, how whatever anyone else happened. <laughs> it's, or even how the techniques unfolded when you step in, all kinds of things will happen. I know I've been experienced where all of a sudden my body was dancing and I understood gates, you know, finally who could tell the dancer from the dance because there was no will. And all that will happen in your way, the way the animals let that happen. I promise you, if you step into your heart right now so deeply and anything you experience that doesn't allow that, a thought, a feeling, a sensation, if you completely merge into the feeling experience of that, these doors will open. They, they're, it's grace. They're available for, for everyone. And if that, if that's too simple and people require complexity, that's fine. Complexity is an, an, a, just a great entry way of simplicity. It's, so it's you, all welcome on a playful planet. <laughs> do you think? Do you think it's completely volitional? Can anyone do what you just said? Can anyone step right in? Or are there some blocks or impediments that some people might? Might it be more difficult for some people than others? That's a good question. I don't know if it's something anyone can do. It's more of something that happens and why this happens to some people at certain times or in this lifetime or not this lifetime is way beyond anything that I think we can explain as a human race. It seems to have to do with some mysterious force that cannot be explained and it seems to have a lot to do with grace. However, I do believe that anyone whose heart calls them to accept an invitation that was just offered. I didn't offer it. The universe has offered it forever. I just spoke it on behalf of the universe. I gave myself that opportunity because it's here. And will uh, it will receive grace. We'll begin to awaken into a realm of perception coming from a very, very deep love that is available to all humans in the same way all animals know it is available as a basis to them. Mm. I think there's something to that. I think, you know, Jesus said, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. I think if a person actually has the sincere desire for a deeper awakening, it sort of sets the wheels in motion to, you know, eventually bring that about. It may not be immediate, uh, but if but one should be patient and you know one as as you're saying earlier if you feel called to do a particular thing to practice a particular technique see a particular teacher or whatever go with that and one thing will lead to the next you may not be doing that thing or seeing that teacher for the rest of your life but you know just keep following your nose and <laughs> you know and I, I do think it it uh, I, I got an email just this week from some woman who said that you know she was feeling kind of little hopeless and depressed because all these people I interview seem to have been graced with this awakening and it, and she can't see it happening to her and I just encouraged her to do what I just said you know to just sort of pick out something that you know the, the next obvious thing that appeals to you that might be a step in that direction and then you know take the first step there's there's an analogy they use well in India I guess where man wants to come out of a mud puddle it's a great big mud puddle and he's standing in the middle of it and there's some guy who's out on the outside the mud puddle at the edge and he says how did I get out of this mud puddle and the guy says well take a step and he said well you're asking me to take a step into the mud and he said yeah but just take that step and then <laughs> take it take another step you know? <laughs> and eventually you'll be out of the mud puddle <laughs> you know longing and seeking are very beautiful qualities they're really qualities of of right before falling in love. There really are kind of falling in love. And so this disappointment this woman is feeling is so sweet and so genuine and so beautiful. And if she could just completely 
perhaps identify where is this disappointment she's feeling right underneath that thought. Her mind has told her that she's not experiencing the grace that others are. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But if she could identify where that disappointment is right in her physical body and then give her consciousness so fully to that place in her body where that is vibrating and just give herself so fully, 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 maybe the disappointment's right in her heart, just be with that completely till there's nothing left but that sensation. She might just suddenly breathe and drop in to the fulfillment she's seeking, and it could be that simple. A lot of what I do with people when they call me from around the world or come into my office or when I'm teaching the seminars is just give them some witnessing and nudging and assistance to do that so okay there's something we can do yes what can we do yeah yeah i think that's really valuable advice i'm a big believer in the correlation of the body with everything else i mean the state of enlightenment itself or any sort of experience you're having there's something going on in your brain and your in your nervous system and and that goes for feelings of frustration and depression and all that other stuff as well which is why certain drugs help to deal with depression but um, the attention has a healing influence and and if you can identify the physical location of the thing as opposed to just being hung up in the emotional level of it you can actually get to the root of it and resolve yes. it. Yes, yes. As a therapist, of course, I was trained to assist people to make great stories up about their emotional states. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a tradition of fable, and it just came into modern times in that way. And like you said, when there's, there's another way to approach emotions where we fully embody them. So I have learned really from the animals, from stepping into the reality, primarily of cats who are very skilled at this, mm. that when we take away first the judgment, so frustration isn't bad or good, sadness isn't bad or good, jealousy isn't bad or good, ecstasy isn't bad or good, et cetera, et cetera. Generosity just is all these qualities or emotions. If I take away my mental construct and concepts about what those are and simply step into the vibration, they reveal themselves to be a creation very different than what I conceived them to be through my conditioning, through my years as a human in different cultures. And in that stepping into those vibrations, vast, vast fullness, vast connectedness with all until there's this dissolving. The I starts to dissolve. It's just not there. Hmm. And so these wonderful vibrations that we've categorized into things we have to fix and medicate, might, and I'm not making a statement whether medication is good or bad, it's not even my business, it's a personal decision, but might offer, not might, do offer another doorway into awakening. And so many uh, spiritual traditions and religious traditions, all in very good intention, have given people the idea, and since people made those, we have given ourselves the idea, I should say, that certain feelings are bad and if we can just stop ourselves as though we're separate from those feelings we'll solve things of course that just can causes contraction and contraction causes explosion in time and that can be a world war or it can be a personal disease and again I'm not saying those things aren't going to happen on a planet of life and death they do what I am saying is there's an invitation here when you're feeling something that you think is wrong or not spiritual or not religious or not enlightened instead just let that go and step into its gift. It's just a vibration, and it will start to vibrate you into a whole new awareness. And mm. that's what people are seeking. They're seeking to be here in this bounty of creation. Of course, we do have preferences. We'd rather be happy than sad. Yes. We'd rather I, be yes. friendly than, than angry, you know, all these things. <laughs> well, I guess that. what you're saying is that, you know, <laughs> since we're human beings, the, the whole range is going to present itself, and we should sort of find the gift or the opportunity in in the so-called bad stuff, it's actually uh, it has potential to help us if we approach it right, right? Yes, we should find the experience in it is what I'm saying. And of course, mentally we all have preferences. I would like to be in bliss, joy, success, et cetera, et cetera, like everyone else. But when I'm really truthful and I deeply sit in all the experiences, that's kind of baloney. It's true on one level, and I'm very human, and I will create my life 
to be successful and joyful, I will do all that myself. I'm not saying I rise above that, but many times in the quietness, day and day again, it becomes more evident to me that that construct has validity, and yet, yet deep in my soul, the soul is very satisfied. The soul is very satisfied be beyond any of these constructs the identity takes to define itself. The identity is just fleeting through us. We're consciousness. We're, we're love. And, and we play with identities. Oh, my identity wants to be joyful and happy. And it's funny, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it takes a lot of energy, and it has a lot to do with what humans do. Hmm. Um, do you think that there are um, situations in which you, know, you absolutely do need some medication or something or or do you feel like that there could actually be a natural holistic kind of approach to almost any um, mental or psychological difficulty no i think that um, eastern and western um, approaches or any other approach for rebalancing a body that has gone out of balance or a mind that's gone out of balance are all needed and all valid that's why they got created so at different times different people myself included very much will require different mechanisms for rebalancing that's something personal each person has to decide for themselves so i'm not prescribing um waking up into a deeper consciousness as a substitute for medicine nor am i saying eastern against western or any of that it's all here it's all valid it all got created it can all be used well and it can all be used not well yeah and i would also add that you know spiritual maturity or evolution isn't necessarily a, a foolproof antidote against difficult times such as depression and, and so on. I, I mean, I know people who were meditating. I have one friend who's been meditating for 40 years and she happens to be in a mental hospital at the moment. And sometimes, you know, intense spiritual practice can precipitate psychological breakdowns and so on, If perhaps if it's not guided properly. But um, it's it's not as simple and clear-cut uh, a situation as one, one might think. No, I know for myself that um, there are periods I go through where I'm experiencing a lot of unconditional joy and peace and bliss and laughter. And I remember when I was um, you know, out there giving lots of talks and telling people about my seminars from that space, that state I was naturally in. But then other times I, I realized, oh, I, I was really overemphasizing the joy and bliss because I realized, wait a minute, this, this peace is carrying me now. This and, and that's melting into it, and disappointment and disillusionment is coming now, and that's melting into it, that's melting into it. So, so my invitation really is to drop in to what is holding all those experiences. Um, mm. It's not a prescription that we're always happy or blissful or healthy or mentally well or whatever. All that, all that comes and goes. And of course we have to address it. If, you, if you're out of balance, you want to seek help. To get balance, you don't you don't use awakening to rebalance. It, it, awakening's awakening itself. We're just part of its way. Hmm. Okay, we'll probably come back to points related to this, but uh, I want to come back to the animals a little bit more. I live in Iowa, and uh, there are more pigs than people in Iowa, <laughs> and literally. And Great. Most... <laughs> so fun. I would like to go there. <laughs> well, you wouldn't like to go here because <laughs> if you saw the conditions under which those pigs live, oh. it would break your heart. Most oh. of them are in CAFOs, which are confined animal things where there's 1,200 or 2,400 hogs in a single building with yeah. barely enough room to turn around. And in yeah. fact, literally not enough room to turn around. And it's really horrendous. And, and they, they, they literally go insane under those conditions. But the... Uh, you know, the mindset that has created such things appears to be that these are not sentient beings. These are commodities. These, these are things which, you know, are for our, con they're things which are here for our consumption. And they don't have any sensitivity or, in or, or significant intelligence themselves. And personally, I think that, that is both symptomatic of our culture and it's also suicidal for our culture. It, um, you know, that attitude toward animals and toward various other aspects of nature um, is a tremendously serious threat to our own existence. Um, so I just wanted to bring that. I think it, it coarsens the, the, the people who work in these places. It, I, 
I don't know what it does to their hearts. It must be like working as a, as a guard in Auschwitz or something. You couldn't retain yeah. any degree of sensitivity uh, yeah. under those circumstances. Yeah. Um, so anyway, any co comments on that? Yeah, my mind was going the same place to World War II, just um, having um, Jewish blood in uh, me. I, I, I'm so sad that um, humanity has misunderstood at times so deeply that we've hurt people because of their skin color, that we've hurt people because of their gender. Wait a minute, I have to introduce this one. <laughs> Who is this? This is Leela. Hi, Leela. Le <laughs> Uh, and she, she's 17 years old, and we're making her come in for the day because it's too, ho too hot out there. Yeah, here we go. It's like 100 degrees or getting yeah, up there. Uh, yeah, if you, if you want to call me sometime, I'd love to just offer a gratuitous uh, animal reading for all your animals because sure, I'm, I'm not wanting to interrupt the interview for that. Yeah, no, I, I just have to introduce them yeah. as they come in, you know. But I, just, I love it. I love yeah. it. I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted yeah, your train of thought. I, keep keep I'm going so on that. I'm sorry that humanity's heartbreak is so covered up. It, it's so deep and so covered up that we've mistreated uh, our brothers and sisters um, in, in these ways. You know, when I you first told me about the pigs, I was I wasn't thinking, and I, I just flashed to Hawaii where I've met pigs who are wild and really enjoying their life. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and this morning, right before the interview, um, Jesse the cat and I went outside, and there were two baby deer and a mama to greet us, hmm. and just enjoying their life. And mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that humanity has become so desensitized that when we hurt ourselves, when we hurt life, when we hurt our brothers and our sisters in horrible ways that we don't notice. And as you said, that takes a lot of numbing. And so my invitation is for people to sit in the places inside themselves that are numb, because I'm not interested in getting in a polarization fight against anyone who is myself, who is doing that on the planet, who's gotten that, that lost and crazy, but I'd like to step myself into whatever that consciousness is somewhere inside me even though I'm not there in Iowa trapping these pigs you know what I'm saying I I will step into that that trapped feeling so deeply that I find what is that in me I can't control what anyone else as an individual does and where they are in their development but I what I invite people to do when we're feeling upset about what we think others are doing it's rather than polarize from them in the same way they polarize from the pigs and now think the pigs are separate from them, is what does that bring up in you? What I find is each time I step into something that I once thought was unbearable, such as deep hatred or jealousy, things I ran from the most, and I said, well, that's out there. You know, I grew up learning not to be prejudiced. So one day I said, well, you know, I'm part of this whole existence. What if I just sat in consciousness where prejudice exists, whether it's mine or not? And, and in that, a deeper and deeper um, compassion occurs and a deeper love and peace. So then we generate more of that interactions. I really feel the more of us generate from there, the more hope there is of more beings being treated. Well, there's no guarantee and that's not the primary reason to do it because then it becomes something separate from us. But I do invite people to just experiment, step in to what is brought up for you when you witness this kind of cruelty and then out of that some people will take action some people will make life changes some people will just be the space holders quietly of peace in their own home no one knows but they're vibrating that out etc yeah i think there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said and i'm reminded of jesus who who as he was being nailed to the cross didn't say you guys are evil he said forgive them father they know not what they do you know it, it, he was he was saying that you know essentially the, his, cruci his his executioners were, I'm, I'm obviously elaborating here, but were the same kind of radiant soul that we all are, but through that, that light was occluded, uh, you know, so they had gotten so lost, so overshadowed that they could actually do such a thing. Yes, you know. uh, my, some of my deepest teachers, and I, I really ask the universe not to bring any more, I've had enough of them, but some of my deepest teachers, 
I'm just surrounded by wonderful people that I love in this mm -hmm. life. And because of my work, I've met incredible people from all over the world. And they're my teachers. But some of my greatest teachers have been people that have been very cruel and mean, who don't even know me, who just lash out because I spent a lot of time in public for a while, you know, pretty pu big public. And, and, and so my heart got very hurt in those situations. I found myself to be a kind of sensitive person. I didn't choose that. It's just how I am physically and emotionally. And so I had to step into a lot of heartbreak. Things would come toward me that felt very abrasive and mean. And when I stepped into the sorrow of that, I found that it was my heartbreak and the heartbreak of the person delivering some kind of communication. And when I stepped deeper into that, eventually I just felt it, it gave much more space. Space took me instead of a, a reaction eventually to, to, to that. So when we're approached by, by beings who may treat us in a way that doesn't feel good, then there is an opportunity to go into the heart and find, and find a love that can even hold back. Mm -hmm. It's not that we tell anyone it's okay to treat us improperly or anything like that, but it, when those things happen, when there's a personal or big planetary war, if we step in to the experience we're personally having of it, a, a, my, it takes us through layers. It takes us through emotional layers, and those take us into inspired layers. And then at the base of it, there's this deep love, just trying to get through everyone and everything. In, in any way, it will be let through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you ever read uh, Carlos Castaneda's books? Yeah. Long, remember remember yeah. the petty tyrant, Don, Don Juan talks about the, how valuable it could be to come under the jurisdiction of a petty tyrant who will really make your life hell, but the, <laughs> it, has, it has tremendous value in sort of, uh, I don't know, working out your ego or something yeah, like that. You know, you know, in every spiritual tradition and religion, you find something like a fast or, or giving up of something. But I tell you, go live life. Like, give your heart to the universe, and all that happens naturally. You'll mm. be put in cages, and you'll be put in bountiful experiences. And, and I bless all the religious structures. I think they're awesome. But I just want to say they happen very naturally if you just give your heart and soul to where the universe is propelling you. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good point too. I mean, I you know that there's um, actually some intelligence, not some. There's a very profound, unbounded intelligence orchestrating uh, everything, and that things aren't happening in some dumb mechanical way. Every little thing that happens is happening for. I, I, oh, it's it's funny if you say for a reason because then it, it invites you to intellectualize oh why did this happen why did that happen but it's more innocent than that it's more like there's this evolutionary machine and we're all part of it and every, every little thing is sort of ultimately in our own interest although it may not appear to be yes it really is in our interest of evolution from a deep universal heart that's holding all of us mm -hmm. i find my mind comes up with many creations and willful ways it wants to participate and when i just stop that and not because it's bad or wrong it's just there's a greater opportunity and i step into where the heart is it takes me into this depth yeah. and that takes me into a universal creation a flow out of which amazing synchronicities and all kinds of experiences occur and then mm -hmm. if I don't run off into the experience but just stop that and go deeper into that flow there, there's this melting there's this just melting into the amazingness of what is creating us instead mm -hmm. of what we think we need to create for always when we think we need to create it comes Yes, physical survival is important and balance is important, but often it comes back to some kind of identity. And of course, I'm speaking from a very privileged place because I live in the United States and I've never starved. You know, I've never gone a yeah. day with food or shelter. So, I'm t I, and I realize I'm talking from that place and I'm so thankful to have that experience. Um, but I, 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 what I'm trying to get at is even... It, and I've been in some very harsh experiences this lifetime, some very challenging experiences. And even in those experiences, when I could stop from getting caught up in what I thought I willfully had to do about it, and just breathe into creation, <laughs> and, and, and love fulfilled everything, and the steps needed to be taken flowed gracefully, 
they became evident, even if some sorrow was deeply involved in the experience. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So I, what I hear you saying is that if you can kind of just relax a bit and not, you know, swim against the stream, but realize that what's happening is ultimately in your own best interest, you can kind of settle into the the lesson inherent in it or the or the the lesson being offered and um you know i mean because you see that people there's some people who just fight against life constantly you know there's always this sort of you know gr grinding of gears or resistance to to what is and of course it's very california to say oh just go with the flow and all that and, and that that almost implies a complete lack of volition where you just whatever happens you know is cool uh, but there's a kind of a balance point that can be reached in in which you know god helps those who help themselves and you're you, you know you're you're purposeful you're you're volitional and at the same time you you're c completely open to not to not insisting that things happen any particular way and, and actually just sort of you know what I mean? There's a kind of a balance, which is a little bit paradoxical. There's a balance of manifesting and surrendering, of creating right. and surrendering. And That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. And, <laughs> and from, the, from the surrender place, there's no absence of action or mm -hmm. participation. It's a participation of a different fabric. Um, it, it's not a passive, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, a lot of that... I'm going with the flow as I'm not here and I don't know what I'm really feeling and I'm not going to find out because I don't want to deal with life, but we're, you're talking about, <laughs> you're talking about a real surrender into just breathing, relaxing into what, what is, what this universal creation is. Mm -hmm. And from there, personality is beautiful and it does, it, it creates, it, it creates Rick Archer who interviews people and it creates mm -hmm. Lori Moore, who talks to animals and people, it it has its own will, and it, it's it's all prepared to to have a lot of participation in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I often refer to the Gita, but um, but you know, there's a situation which either may be a literal account of something that happened, or might just hold be metaphorical. But uh, you know, at first Arjuna is saying, "I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight this battle," and then and then Krishna kind of turns him around to the point where he sits down. And he says. I can't do anything. I'm just going to live on alms in this world. And then, but then Krishna brings him to the point where he says, you know, okay, now you're going to fight the battle, but you're going to do it established in evenness, established in, in yoga. You're going to do this. And then there will be equanimity and there will be a right act, spontaneous right action. There, it, you won't just be, uh, uh, you know, acting out of ego, but you won't have relinquished all sort of incentive or motivation to action either. Yes, I want to invite people in whatever stance you are called to because humans are humans and animals are animals. We're the same. We will have emotions and we will have times when that is what is called for is a, a hard fight from a balanced place or maybe not from a balanced place or what is called for is a complete release and walk through the streets and and <laughs> live a life of poverty those are both two extremes but mm -hmm. what i'm getting at and they're great and they're great as a perfect starting point for this conversation is what i'm getting at is that there's no right or wrong just be yourself just it's it's so simple everyone just be who you are and and the invitation i'm offering is <clears throat> if you can breathe for a moment and just feel what your heart is vibrating, what, what the universal heart is vibrating right now in all of us is just this light, it's an emanation, it's beyond us, if you can feel that, and then anything around that, thoughts, emotions, sensations, if you can kind of step in to where that physical feeling has you, and just move your consciousness into that, something opens you up, and what actions or passive responses you will take it's almost like you feel your body and your mind are part of this big stream that has you and you asked earlier what can we do and i think when we give ourselves in love when you follow your love what your heart how your heart which is to contribute or give or receive or participate or sit in silence 
those answers start to come. They just do. Somehow it's in the blueprint that you give yourself and all answers are brought forth. This is my personal experience. This, I truly believe, is it is a possibility for everyone right now. You don't mm-hmm. need to do anything else but be who you are and find out who that is by sitting and experiencing it. <laughs> so would you suggest a literal sitting where a person just kind of goes into a meditative state and really you know dives into this and, and gives it their full attention or are you saying that it's something that one can do on the fly you know while driving your car or dealing with the kids or whatever or are you saying maybe both it might be good to sort of have a, an active practice that one learns to kind of tune into what's going on and at the same time take some bits of time where you can just be free of the hubbub and, and um, focus on that I think it's so valuable to have plenty of time for whatever one's practice is, even if it's simply sitting in the quiet or any any practice. And to have that, that's our place where we, we deepen into what is reality and we access surrender and creation. Then we go out into the world stage in our family or our job or the grocery store or wherever. And, and then we get to part of the whole experiment, the artistic experiment of humanity is then we get to find out uh, how does that go into creation so that, oh, our philosophy and ethics are sure tested there, but also it's just an artistic kind of balance of the inner and the outer that is forever available. I don't think personally anyone could just be running around in this outer world all the time and fall into a depth of profound stillness and experiencing of all this is one without solitude time maybe it happens but for most I would think time in in some kind of quiet or if that quiet requires a practice it's not practice isn't needed and for some it is perfect is really uh, seems very very necessary and valuable if if someone doesn't fit into that awesome I would agree with you I think it is important for the vast majority, there's exceptions to every generality, but I think it would be valuable for most persons to have that opportunity. And you know what? I mean, people tend to get habituated to stimulation and excitation. And so the first thing they're going to find when they take some quiet time is that their mind is just going a mile a minute, you know, and they, they, they may not feel like sitting there. There's all these impulses and, and inner sort of tendencies to stand up and get up and go do something but if you can kind of recognize that for what it is and and allow yourself the opportunity to de-excite uh it will be time well spent yes if you can even just step into the experience of that excitement that vibration that will that will naturally uh re-stabilize or recreate what the vibration is and like you were saying earlier feel the physical correlate to that, you know, f- you know, if, if the mind is going a mile a minute thinking about everything you have to do, feel what's happening in your heart, you know, feel what's happening in your solar plexus, you know, cor- in corresponding to all that mental um, noise. Yes, that will take you right back into yourself, into a really a silent experience. Eventually, it might be in layers, or it might be like that. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about you, and and I still and we still have plenty to talk about in terms of the animal. Um, communication thing I have a lot of questions about that but uh, I know you've you know you spent some time with Ganga G and I don't know what else you've done but um, you know did you kind of become a spiritual aspirant at a young age and how did you pursue that aspiration privately I grew up in Washington DC I grew up among a family of uh, lawyers doctors I grew up among friends with you know in politics my father worked down at DuPont Circle he he worked for Chief Justice Earl Warren. That's how he started out. You know, it's a different world. Maybe it's changed now. <laughs> it was nothing like what I encountered when I came out west or got It's to worse now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thankful for my very grounded and practical roots, I can't tell you. I, I bless that every day and the intellectual articulation that went with that. I'm so thankful. I mean, I didn't, I didn't live a life where people could do the California, you know. Oh, you know, I knew you. you I knew you in a past life, and that's what this problem is about. We had to things were. You had to work. You had to do life. You, you couldn't get by like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, but you would be. It just it, the environment didn't support it. So, right. um, <laughs> so very quietly and privately, I felt I was in love with the universe, 
And sometimes I would talk to the universe and we'd have conversations, <laughs> but I didn't have anyone I thought I would really be able to express that to in that kind of a language. Although I feel my mother is a very mystical, unconditionally loving guide and teacher for me, although she would never speak any of the spiritual terminology I use, or she didn't have any familiarity with psychological terms or anything I became part of in, in another time in my life. But I very quietly was in love with the universe, and I had um, my cat, Tiger, who was a great teacher. So um, when I was a lot older, and I lived in communes and ashrams and um, had all kinds of experiences, I finally really So by that time you were reading spiritual books and doing spiritual practices and all that, right? Well, the funny thing is I would go to these, I'd end up in, not even meaning to, I'd keep finding myself in these spiritual communities and places where I didn't even know that's where I was going. Like someone hmm. said, go check this out, or there's a summer camp over here. And a lot of times I would meet people there and they would tell me, oh, oh, yes, you are one of this group or whatever. And I never felt I was part of any group. I, I, I felt I loved the people I met in each group. You know, I had good relationships and challenging relationships and wherever I went, like everyone else. But I, I didn't feel I was, you know, part of a system. It never felt real to me. And eventually I just kind of trusted myself and I'd been inspired by many many beautiful teachers by then um, a Sufi teacher named Sheikh Ahmed uh, a teacher named Anandima um, but much more deep and this was before I met Gangaji who's just been a complete turning point for me and I'll get to that in a moment but um, the teachers that finally got a hold of me came not so long ago I think it's only been maybe 10 years now I first prayed to return to heaven on earth. I don't know why I prayed that. I didn't plan to pray that. Seriously, something took my whole soul and heart and just prayed that through me. And then there was a number of years where all these unconditional joy and bliss experiences came and my connection to the animals was primary. And I'd meet animals everywhere. I'd go for a walk and a salamander crawled up and would be on my back and I called out to the ocean and Molokai, if you are all really talking to me and I'm not insane, give me a sign. And a whale jumped up and went like that for half an hour. It, dogs were in, in the seminars and birds, birds would come into our seminars and I would say, does this dog, goat come with anyone? No, the dogs come on time and leave on time. It was magical. And I mean, now I just take that kind of stuff for granted because I'm so integrated into it. But my cat um, reincarnated, and I, I, my cat, my cat, after I made this prayer, soon left his body. A coyote ate him, and I was so in love with my cat Jesse, like deeply in love with this cat, and I was completely devastated. And um, he came back in another body, and he he made it so evident. He took me into space where there was no time, and there there was no space, and there was only oneness. That was my first full experience of that this lifetime now it's more of something that's like the basis and how it, did you know it was the same cat i knew it was jesse because when he got back he looked into my eyes for an hour mm -hmm. and took me into this space and then he walked around the house and showed me all his habits he had a little quirk where he he will scratch my neck and i'll scratch his he did a little thing in the kitchen where if until I figure out the right food, I get a very gentle little nip on the ankle. If I'm overworking, the computer plug is pulled out. In his new body, he was not big enough to do it, but he made it clear that he was trying to do it. And people came over, and he would greet the people he already knew, and they said, mm. oh, Jesse's back. Huh. So what, it, it's like he flipped the switch. There was this oneness experience that was going on since childhood, and there was all this conditioning telling me, you're imaginative, you're crazy, don't believe that. And the flip, the switch was flipped. And can can you elaborate a bit on the oneness experience? Yes. Um, the best way I can say it, experiencing it in this moment now, is a profound love has given birth to all of us here now. We're in a, we're in a particular formation where I'm speaking to you, and Jesse's up there, and there's some birds over there, and you know, friends are near, and. And, and there's no, there's not a separateness that my mind got. I literally remember conditionings coming in in early childhood to try to convince me, like, 
I don't know where those energies came from, but energies tried to make me think that I was separate from you. Happens to everybody. Yes. And you know, it's a human but, condition. But the heart, the heart was feeling something very different. And when I came back around to really embracing the communication with the animals, that there was just no need to pretend anymore. I discarded all the pretending. I, the pretending got me through college and graduate school without people thinking I was insane. You know, if I'd gone out, I'd gone out and just said all this stuff, people would have thought I was nuts. So, <laughs> so I learned to articulate a bunch of different languages that are socially acceptable in different circles, and then. I could, and some people I'm sure still think I'm nuts, and that's fine, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the, animals, the animals gave me the trust to speak what I, what I experience is the truth of this universe. It's just everything's form coming in and out, born and dying every second, and this, this is just part of that, and here is this. Gosh, how do you say it? It's like the color red. There's no lines. There's just waves among this beautiful creation. Oh, I'm, I feel like I'm the outer edge of creation. Like a person, myself, is just the very, very outer edge, like a toenail, a little reflection of something creation's dreaming up. I'm a mask for a dream that's not even mine. I'm just, I'm a costume that was given. And my mind still thinks I'm wearing it. <laughs> and my heart can see... Even that's not true. Mm. That's nice. Speaking of crazy, my mother used to say, everyone is crazy except I and thou, and sometimes I think thou art. <laughs> <laughs> One of her little pet phrases. <laughs> um, no, that's beautiful. Um, it's like, I think what you're expressing is, you, you know, and, you're expressing that within your experience, when people often talk this way, but it sounds like it is your experience, that we are multidimensional beings. You know, on one level, we're these physical bodies with our personal tendencies and hang-ups and whatnot. And on a deeper level, which for some people is just sort of conceptual or perhaps vaguely intuitive, you know, there is a sort of a, a more unified state or a more unified uh, subtle level of, of being or of awareness and the whole enlightenment game as I understand it is you know to broaden the spectrum of one's conscious experience so it incorporates the whole range um, and I think you just gave a nice expression to that and it sounds to me that as though for you in particular um, animals were like a spiritual practice you know you they were a, a technique which enabled you to kind of tune in through their innocence and simplicity to that deeper level. Would that be correct to say? I would say they were my teachers who I love and mm. their beautiful, unconditional love <clears throat> called forth such trust in me that I could hear and see what my heart was always hearing and seeing louder than what my mind had been trained to tell me. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself working in the capacity of like a, you know, in an animal shelter or, you know, rescue, an animal rescue kind of thing or anything like that? Or No, no I just mm. spend a lot of time with wildlife who became my friends, hawks, ravens, all kinds of animals. And mm -hmm. day in and day out, I work with my teacher and guide, Jesse Just Enjoy the Cat. He truly <laughs> is my yeah. teacher, mm -hmm. <laughs> one of my teachers. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, so, you know, during that phase I went through, I, I was called a bit, now, I'm, now I work with everyone again, but I had to go through an incubation period where I had to call myself out or something called me out of manifestations around suffering. And mm. suffering is a very important part of the planet. I've assisted people who are suffering for years, but I had to call myself out of that for three or four years and be immersed in kind of unconditional blisses and joys and look at manifestation that's only coming from a highest positive place mm. and, and and at a certain point then I prayed with all my heart once again I didn't know where it came from I didn't have a choice it prayed itself through me to remove all my false identities mm. oh my god that was a crash course I went from these years of just bliss into hell 
you wouldn't believe the things that would happen. I won't even say it on the internet. It doesn't even come out true in the movies. Every terrible thing that could happen started happening before huh. I could keep up with it till I was, I literally almost died. I got, I was so burned on every single level of my life. And I'd never experienced much betrayal. I was betrayed personally, professionally. I was heartbroken. I, I, oh God, the things that happened were crazy. Hmm. But I had prayed for that. Something in me had. And um, and and so then then there had to be an expansion into really not just the bliss phase, which I hear is a phase. And and now there's that's accessible anytime. I I can access bliss. I can sit here and say, okay, I'm purchasing with bliss and joy, and it comes. <clears throat> but there had something deeper called me. That's around the time I did meet Gangaji, and I I recognized her really deeply. I mean, she was so familiar to me. And she and I just connected very deeply. I, I, I didn't quite know what was going on. Someone said, you have to go meet her. And I'm like, I don't need to meet anyone. And people were coming from around the world to receive spiritual uh, seminars and satsangs from me. And I said, I don't need to meet any teacher. And But my partner went to meet her. And when he came home, I saw light all around him. And I'm not a seer. I don't I'm a feeler, but I couldn't miss it. There was just all this white, bright light, and I just said, I've got to go see this person, and I had met her husband on the radio. We had been interviewed together. We clashed, <laughs> so that was another, like, I'm not going to meet this person, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I, I went, I watched, and I saw people were telling her some problems and questions. I was just like, I have to go tell. I just felt she was my friend. I ran up. And I, I, it, it's on YouTube actually. I saw it. I listened yeah. to it. Yeah. And we, and we connected, and I felt her invitation so deeply to embrace the dark as well as light. Not the to not to embrace the dark to ever act out on it or be it or say do something unethical, but to accept it all in my heart to merge so deeply into my heart that I stopped making, well, this feeling's okay and this isn't. And for three years after I met her, I, would, I sat in everything I always didn't want to feel, inwardly. Outwardly, it was all happening around me anyway. Inwardly, like I said before, prejudice, jealousy, hatred, everything I said, no, no, I'm above that. Hmm. And spaciousness came and came and came, and, and life just became a very different existence from that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, in the traditional Vedic scriptures, bliss is not considered to be the final destination. No, in it's fact, not. they say that we're encased in a number of sheaths or koshas, they call them, and, and the, the deepest one is Nandamaya kosha, um, which is the bliss sheath, but that still is an encasement, you know, and then there's obviously a breakthrough beyond that into something more fundamental. So um, are you kind of saying that you, you marinated for about three years in... Um, you probably withdrew from a lot of the activities you had been engaging in, and you uh, you just kind of w spent a lot of time de dealing with wave after wave of yucky stuff that had been, you know, uh, perhaps unknown to you, and but was buried there. And and then as yeah. with each with each clearing away of of some of the yuck, you experienced some more expansion. Yes, and I, I didn't remove myself from society at that time. I was still very active and teaching a lot. I mm. was just going through a very different kind of experience. And yes, thing, inward space began to open and open and through all those different layers of, of quality and feeling experience. Everything, eventually what the openings are like, a lighter fabric and I saw oh light is getting lighter it has very little to do with me light is getting lighter love is becoming deeper love I'm not here but I wasn't saying I'm not here. when you pop out you say I'm not here but then you're here so mm -hmm. it's it's like an experience of a the vehicle of life utilizing its creation and it's endless and mm -hmm. and there's so many energies in the world that then Things can shift in a day. I can tell you that, and the next day I could be caught up in something that really has my ego. It's forever. It's forever. There's, you know, I hear over and over in spiritual and religious circles that was the point, and then they were awakened. And if only I could reach light. That has not Life is endless. It doesn't work like that. It's not a black. And, that's the opposite of what is being spoken about. Yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I, I resonate with that. I mean, just yesterday I was 
reading something by Nisargadatta in which he, he was really insisting that for him there was no shred of individuality left, no shred of personal identity. Of course, he was addicted to cigarettes and he died of lung cancer, but, uh, may, but I suppose he would have said that's just the, the kind of the body-mind mechanism with, with its habits, but, that, but that there's no personal identity driving that. It's just kind of carrying on with its own momentum. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's his experience. It could be true, and I'm not there. I have yeah. I have plenty of ego, yeah. <laughs> and I haven't met anyone who doesn't. I mean, let's face it. When we're giving, when someone is giving satsang, what is their job? It is to step fully into that creation for all that surround them, and then. 24 hours a day, follow someone around when they're with their kids, when they're with their grandkids, when they're teaching, when they're private and they think nobody's looking. When they're cheating on their wife. People are <laughs> human. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's... And, and let's love ourselves because that's what we are and not give ourselves the message we're supposed to be more than that. That's my experience. I mean, I do have... There, there's one person I'm thinking of who will know who she is. I've said this before, who's listening to this show, who says that for her, there is, like Nisargadatta, there is no individuality left. Um, for, for me, I, like you just said, there is very much a sense still of individuality. I can't say where that might go eventually, uh, but at the very same time, there's a dimension which is not that, and you know, which yeah, is yeah. Pure, pure, silent, non-individual, universal stuff. Uh, and the two get along quite nicely. They, when you think about it, they seem to be, con you know, ultimately paradoxically uh, dissimilar. But there's no discernible um, demarcation between them. You know what I mean? Yes, I notice that when we're in states of deeper dissolving, a flavor appears, an essence that each individual is, as long as they're incarnate. And a most humbling experience I had when I was doing lots and lots of seminars, the satsangs in Hawaii, and more and more this was dissolving, the mind reported, <laughs> you know, the mind reported something like that, like there's, there's very little identity here. And then, thank God, the super ego said, well, good, you know, if that's the truth, you have a little ego trip going on. <laughs> and I wish that for everyone instead of you know, hmm. great reports about their extreme enlightened states, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it's, well, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting topic to me because I, I interview people every week and I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of always trying to fit it into a con the context of my understanding while at the same time allowing my understanding to expand and not just insisting that things fit into my conceptual box, which may be limited. But I do hear people all the time saying, well, you know, there is no individual, there is no personal self, there is no actual doer uh, and I I just kind of wonder to what extent that is really their experience or to what extent that might be an intellectual understanding which perhaps is buttressed by an intuitive flavor of it which they have taken to be you know the reality or taken to actually be complete realization but which might still be very much conceptual without their knowing it I think it's a great idea for everyone to assume that they have an ego till the day they die and then what happens next, you know, I have my ideas, other people have different ideas, but let's just stay on this life for now. I think it's a really good ex assumption to make that gratitude and humility might go a little further than reports about who we think we are. That That is a very real state, that state where all, all is happening and I is little i is not creating creating it is true it's real it, it, it's it's happening and then little i who's being interviewed whoever's being interviewed some i showed up for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would seem or if you drop a brick on your toe there is <laughs> there's some i which you know would would really the brick had fallen rather fallen on you know on a, on another brick rather than on the toe <laughs> it yeah. seems to me but and if the invitation someone's offering by saying there is no i is is here here's a hand find this find this where you aren't and only grace is that's beautiful and, and that that's true and we also function with ego mm. My original teacher, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, gave a number of lectures about something he called Lesha Vidya, which translates as faint remains of ignorance. 
And he said, as long as you're functioning as a human being, as long as you're breathing, there's got to be some Lesha Vidya or you wouldn't be able to function. And by ignorance, he meant, you know, some sense of individuation, which in the final ultimate analysis is, you could call it ignorance. Uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of not the ultimate reality. But if you're going to function, you know, if you're going to be a, a biological entity, breathing and eating and pooping and everything else, there's got to be some, some remnant of that to make functioning possible. So anyway, that's the way he presented yes. it. Yes, I always bring it back to, uh, because as long as I'm alive, I'll have a mind and an ego that will want to report things to me about my identity or others' identities. Even if it stops for long periods, it will um, most likely start up again. And so I always remind, I always create a remembrance, or a, a remembrance is already there that awakening is awakening itself. I'm, I'm positive about this. I'm positive that right now awakening is awakening itself and it's really not about I, but I am responsible for I. What do you mean by that? Awakening is awakening itself. The experience that I'm having many times and I, I don't have any experience consistently. I, I don't. I have, I have experience that changes and then fundamentally something is the same. But my experience is that evolution is, is in a creative place of opening itself up to its own oneness, to its own beingness, including all. Mm -hmm. And in that state, that, in that state, this I does dissolve. And, and when this I comes back, in my conceptual understanding, that's experiencing awakening. When I'm reporting on my awakening, it's about me again. It's about I. It's about my identity. And so I'm in the opposite of, of, of that experience I was setting out to describe. I think, I think I know what you mean. It's reminiscent of what Andrew Cohen was saying uh, when I interviewed him last week, his whole evolutionary enlightenment thing, thing, that we are kind of instruments through which the evolutionary force, which gave rise to the universe 14 billion years ago, is, you know, pushing the envelope to new levels of, of, of uh, exploration, new levels of expression. And, um, you know, I suppose we could say that that evolutionary consciousness or awareness or force is in and of itself awake. It doesn't need anyone or anything, but if it wants to play in the waves of, of expression, play in the waves of manifestation, then it does need, um, you know, manifest instruments such as cats and fleas <laughs> and uh, and human beings and so on in order to experience all the variety that, uh, of possibilities that that implies. Yes, and somehow when we give our love to that, if that's where we feel our love going, the wave, the wave takes us. The wave takes us into this fulfilling, generating uh, creation. Very true. I, I almost get the feeling that if a person sort of consciously volunteers to go faster and further, it's like the, the intelligence of the universe says, okay, we got a live one here, you know, let's give him some juice. And there's a, there's a quickening and there's an acceleration um, that takes place. It's like if you consciously volunteer to participate will, you know, in the in the in the experiment of, of evolution, then uh, God helps those who help themselves. You're 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 kind of given a, uh, he, that intelligence comes to your aid. I would fully agree with that, and I would mm. also say that whatever is in the way of that shows up more blatantly too. For yes, to be aware, seen, experienced, and responded to, mm -hmm. released, melted into something. Because it needs to, because those things need to be cleared away if you're really yeah. going to do this, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, you can't say you're going to do it and then be oblivious to all the things that are, that are blocking it. Somehow those things have to be confronted. My experience is that the more I give myself to this love, the more ego I have to see, the more little trips I have to take responsibility for in my own mind and make a choice to release or merge so much into that something different happens that ha can only happen from grace. Willpower doesn't seem to shift it. Because mm, mm. I, I went through years of that, you know, I was really into therapeutic community and got trained to be a therapist. So 
a lot of creative will is a great thing for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it only goes so deep. Yeah, I think the, <laughs> the the significance of willpower in this point is is making the willful choice to get out of the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is which is not to say you know continue to exert the will, but just sort of cooperate. Yeah. The, the surgeon can't operate if you're squirming all around. No, and sometimes cooperating means you know saying yes to things that don't rationally seem to make sense to one's personal individuality, but trusting right. that that's being propelled from someplace deeper. Yeah, that's good. All right, now let's talk about the animals a little bit more. Um, it's like, you know, sometimes when I hear you and, and um, even my friend whom I spoke with talk about the kind of communication she gets from animals, that communication seems much more sophisticated than you would expect an animal to be able to convey. I mean, you know, our dogs, as much as we love them, they love to, they like to eat cat poop and they would like nothing better than to kill the mailman, you know? So if you hear some kind of wise, eloquent uh, <laughs> message coming from a dog, you think, well, is that em being embellished by the person who's the animal communicator? Are they just adding their, <laughs> adding their own kind of human interpretation to it? Or is that really what the animal is, is saying? That's a really important question, and I want to address two aspects of that. First of all, as a species, biologically, each uh, animal, including the human animals, programmed for some purpose. So, of course, we know dogs are protectors, they're loyal, and so this programming, regardless of what soul comes in, in my experience, to a dog's body, usually has a programming to protect, because I've met some very kind dogs who have absolutely insisted to me they have to bite people if people are, you know, going too close to their person. Person and the person's mortified and you know how could the dog do a mean thing and the dog just doesn't get it I'm not doing a mean thing this is my job Instinct. So, yeah and so see but what we don't always admit as humans is we're doing that much rigid instinctual behavior as well in our and, own way yes and we yeah. don't call that a lack of intelligence so first of, first of all yes there's there's a as soon as you're born your soul is married to body the incarnation and there's they're two different entities and they're trying to orchestrate something that seems to be part of the experiment for animals as well as people but the other um the other point you mentioned is can the animal communicator be just you know like, well this is what i think so i'll say that's what the dog thought that's a beautiful question because it's very complex it has to do with what's subjective and what's objective and all conversations are a co-creation between all involved. So if you send a client to 10 different therapists and the client tells all 10 therapists the same life struggle, ask the 10 therapists and you'll hear something very in common about what each therapist says and then you'll, feel some, you'll hear something different. And it's the same with the animal communicator and the animal. That's the beauty of life through synchronicity Hopefully that person will end up with the therapist who has just a little bit of something in their essence and perspective that will assist a balance in that client. So now it depends also on the animal communicator because I always tell people if they ask me how to better hear, feel, and see what someone else, an animal or a person is expressing to notice are you hearing, feeling, or seeing something coming in a different flow than your own? Are you hearing some words that you don't usually use? Are you seeing some images that aren't the way you dream at night? Are you feeling some feelings that have a different flavor than what you're used to? Okay, that's a clue that it's more likely that you are in communication with this other being. Now you have to do a test and find out to alleviate your doubts. Ask the animals to give some assurance and if the animals are connected with people, that's what I did in the beginning. Ask the people, I think well, your animal might be saying this to me. Does this have any truth in your life, or am I making this up? Hmm. Yeah, the, the, this uh, friend of mine, one experience she told me about was she did a reading on this cockatiel that belonged to some friends of, mutual friends of ours, actually. And she just kept getting this image of dark and chemical smells. And she didn't know what, what it meant or anything else, but she ended up, she talked to the people, and it turned out this bird had previously lived with some people who had a lot of animals, some of whom were the enemies of cockatiels, you know, and so the cockatiel hid under the kitchen sink uh, mm -hmm. in the cupboard to stay away from these predators. And mm -hmm. obviously there were chemicals and bleach and stuff stored under there, and it was dark. So, 
<laughs> you know, that's what yeah. she said. There, so there's an example of something that wasn't at all embellished by her personal interpretation. She didn't yeah. know what it, what it meant. But then yeah. there are other things where you hear people sometimes going into these long spiels that, you know, sound like a philosopher is, is giving them. And you wonder, <laughs> can that really come out of a hamster or <laughs> whatever yeah, the animal? You know, it can. I mean, because I've <laughs> talked to animals who are just so simple and just think with a few words. Like some people think more in visual images. And I've talked to animals who have exquisite philosophy and inspirational language and they're also different just like people hmm. do you think that in uh, in in general uh the souls that inhabit animals bodies are sort of lesser evolved souls and which will eventually evolve into human bodies or do you think that uh, well, in general and there could be exceptions to that generality or do you think that it's really impossible to say and that there might be as many evolved souls among the animals as there are among the humans? Well, I'll answer in two ways. From a uh -huh. rational, practical view, because I try to maintain some balance, my logic would tell me that all souls are equal. But what I truly believe in my heart, having spoken to many, many animals, hundreds, different species, passed over on Earth and wildlife, is in general most, I would say if not 100, 99% of souls that are blessed to incarnate into the animal life are far, far, far ahead of humans. And insects included, and plants, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I have no doubt anymore. I, I find <laughs> that hard to believe. Um, I, that's that's you know, cool. That's, well, just, yeah. but it might just be my sort of bias or my, you know, habitual way of thinking for, for decades. Because it, it makes sense to me that there is a kind of a hierarchy in creation and that we kind of evolve up the hierarchy through different forms as we go along uh, and that human beings are by no means the top of the hierarchy but they're a pretty evolved stage and certainly more evolved than, than a mosquito uh, and that there could po be a possibility I suppose where a human soul is, is reincarnated as a mosquito but, uh, but in general a mosquito's nervous system is really not going to be able to accommodate uh, a soul which you know has evolved to the point where it is more uh, at home in a human body well as the Mayans said you know perhaps or as the Mayans believe that hierarchy might go in the opposite direction that by the time you get to a real state of oneness you can be a tree you don't need so many tools to learn the lessons of your illusions as the human mm -hmm. and the animals would come in between human and plant um, but what I want to say about that is what's going to happen if we're able to keep this planet alive. The permaculturists of the planet, the humans are starting to think in terms of per permaculture, but it's the animals who are already the real livers of permaculture, unless they're domesticated, but they still do a pretty good job. Cats bathe themselves, etc. But uh, where I'm getting with this is that the um, humans are finally waking up to the complex, intelligence murder of the crows is just the beginning it's a um i think it was a pbs i think it was actually in public tv it's easy to find through netflix it's a it's a it's the beginning wake up call to the fact that oh my god the animal's language is so complex they know so much more about what's going on than we realize and just like people in the united states you can easily think oh, well, that culture is behind because we have no idea about that culture. We didn't live in that culture. We didn't ask them questions. I mean, now we're, you know, the United States has really changed. Cross-cultural um, education is required, but it's a complete cultural misunderstanding. People yeah, like understand. we think the Bushmen are primitive or something, and yet when you really yeah. learn, learn about their culture, you learn that there are many things which, you know, we would do well to, to understand that they take for granted and so on. Even their body language and linguistics, like, I mean, cats have so many different meows. Those elephants knew exactly where to go in their fringi. So I think that in terms of personality biology, humans just are very clueless about it. When you get, here's an experiment I give to everyone. Just ask the big animals come in and educate you. They started to teach me so many things. The deers have a game where they get in a circle and they play this tag game where one stands up, it's, it's like a complicated game, but you don't usually see this because people's eyes aren't open to it. When I was in Mexico teaching a seminar, I ran into a turkey vulture who had just landed dead, I don't know how, 
wings spread, surrendered up to the sky, and the soul was just leaving the body, and we sat together for a long time. I mean, the body was finished, but the energy was still moving out. We sat together, and then I went on a walk, and the other turkey vultures let me come and just hunch with them in their circle. And they, they circled around me, like, um, in in communication, in, in, in respect, and then later, a couple nights later, I told the people... Wait a minute, you have to meet the final <laughs> member of the family. This is, this is a very adorable member. I love yeah. this. This is Shanti. <laughs> Hi, Shanti. <laughs> yeah. And she, also, she also has a, uh, a story of rescue from dire circumstances. But uh, anyway, that was Shanti. I'm sorry. So, turkey yeah, vulture. Anyway, I, I told everyone, I said, those are my friends. I sat with them yesterday, and people were like, okay, Dr. Lurie's a little far out. And they flew over, and they waved to us. Hawks and ravens come over here and wave to us, and we moved 20 miles, and my raven friends found us. That's smart. If they move 20 miles, I don't know that I'd find them. Oh, I'll, I'll grant you that. I mean, there are things that animals do which are amazing. I mean, the monarch butterflies, how do they migrate to such and such a place, and how, how is it that they're actually able to, you know, be attuned to the Earth's magnetic field, and, and obviously bloodhounds can smell 100 times better than humans. So, I mean, there are all kinds of things which animals are capable of doing and seeing and even knowing, which humans aren't. But if you look at the actual complexity of the animal's nervous system and the complexity of their brain, you know, the human ner brain is by far more large and sophisticated uh, an instrument. And yeah, well, it's, it's thinking very complicated things that are destroying the planet and taking us away from the awakening of which we speak. So, yeah, that's but, more <laughs> well, but, but some would say that that's kind of a necessary um, no man's land that we have to walk through to get to the other side. In other words, in a, at a certain level of evolution, we've been granted free will and we've been granted this sort of much more sophisticated way of functioning, which makes us little gods in a sense, but gods that, you know, don't really know how to play the game properly. We and that, but that's a kind of a necessary um, minefield that we have to walk through to get to the other side, which would be complete liberation. And that animals, both in terms of their soul evolution and sophistication of physiology, are just not equipped to have that sort of spiritual illumination that that humans are. That's People an argument. Believe that. Yeah, that's yeah. not my experience. That's that's an experience, or, or it's a belief people have. So you think animals can um, attain self-realization in the sense that we would say humans do? Uh, if if it weren't for teachings um, and friendship from the animals, I would not be on this interview with you today, and everything I speak about would not be my reality. It would be some theory. So you say that. An so when you say that animals have taught you, you don't know. You don't just mean as sort of innocent expressions of nature, who you know that you align to their sweetness and their simplicity, and so on. You you mean that they are actually beings of a higher order or or of higher wisdom, such as you know comparable to gurus, who who um, were sent to or who whose function is to enlighten you or enlighten human beings. I would say in some cases there is a spontaneity of mutual experience so that synchronistically I and animals ended up together in a state of innocence and simplicity that gave birth to an awakening through universal grace. And other times I met with animals who had a message to deliver to me just as I might have a message to deliver to another person and not know it. Simply by me being myself, someone else grows and learns that particular animals came to me and I came to them so that there is mutual benefit. And then other times, like in the case with Jesse Just Enjoy My Cat, that he was deliberately insistent that I learn certain things and give up some old concepts that he did consider that to be one of his jobs on this planet. And some animals I speak to who go with people will tell me my job in their life is to teach them this. But some people feel their job is to be a teacher, and that's just how they came in. Other people and animals are being themselves in whatever they, way that they are, and by that in itself becomes inspiration to others in particular ways. Hmm. All right. Well, um, I'm not, not sure we totally nailed the point. but um, Let's keep going. Can we keep going till we nail it? Let's yeah, nail yeah. It. Let's try to let's, nail it. Okay. So maybe it, it'll take a little bit of reiteration maybe on both our parts to okay. to, to attempt to nail it. I'm ready. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, at the, at, you know, at the risk of being redundant, um, 
you know, I, did, I guess I just, I have a bias, yes. which, may, which may or may not be a bias. It might be an actual understanding of the way things yes. are, or it might be a personal bias that, you know, I've kind of been cultured in over the years, Likewise. which, which, which the opposite of yours. Yeah, yeah. yeah, which, which is that, um, there is a, a sort of a progression of, uh, complexity and of, and of evolution of, of souls from maybe we could say start with rocks on the one end of the spectrum you know uh, and and are there enlightened rocks um, are there are there rocks which are as conscious as a human being can be you know you can ask questions like that and then moving along you know to amoebas and and more complex systems and, and going frogs and amphibians and you know mammals and and moving up you know to the spectrum to the human species and i would say you know i've said this in other interviews that it, pr it certainly wouldn't stop there we, we might have only traversed half the spectrum when we get to the most highly evolved humans and it could go on there to celestial beings and gods and devas and angels and god knows what um but that it's it's not like um judgmental to say mm -hmm. this it's just uh, that there is this natural structure in creation and it moves from uh, the, the simple to the complex in terms of physical structure and it moves from uh, pretty much unaware uh, with very little capacity for awareness on the level of rocks to you know extremely aware and, and not only aware in terms of particular sensory capabilities such as being able to smell like a bloodhound or hear like a bat but um, I'm, I'm in terms of actual the ability to embody and reflect pure awareness that that we that as the evolutionary um, spectrum we move along through it there's greater and greater ability to do that and that it's not um, uh, arrogant necessarily to say that humans in general although there's some notable exceptions perhaps have a greater capacity for for embodying pure awareness and realizing it in its pure state than do simpler forms of life such as insects and and whatnot and even cats or even cows although Ramana Maharshi said his cow was enlightened uh, so anyway that's that's a reiteration but perhaps with some elaboration of the way I've come to understand it again it's a potentially totally a, just a theory that uh, I've kind of you know taken for granted but may not be true Yes, and um, I'm not here really to dispute that theory necessarily because ultimately, who knows what is true? I mean, right. a lot of people seem to, but I, I really, I, at the end of the day, I do not know a thing. I, and I promise you, I really don't. But like you, I have a bias, and I have a preference, and I have a, a framework which I tend to believe. So let's put this into simple terms what species are more complex and what species can be aware of their awareness. That's what we're really looking at. We're mm -hmm. saying, can beings be enlightened? Well, enlightened is a state beyond making uh, tabulations and organization about its existence. So, of course, animals can be in that state, but can they, like humans, have an outside witness and awareness of that? And different people will argue that very differently. So my experience is yes, animals, many animals are awakened, many more so than humans, but awakened is even, you know, awakened is an endless state. Yeah, and you have to really define clearly what we mean by awakened or else we might be talking about several, two different things. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, yes. can animals be awakened as Ramana Maharshi was awakened or are we talking, or is that a particular use of the word awakening which you don't really mean when you say animals are awakened? So what are we really asking? Can animals be aware of their awareness? What are we asking? What are we asking? Um, what are you asking me? I would say, <laughs> um, and, and incidentally, there in if you hold any the Vedic literature in any um, regard, there there are stories like in the Yoga Vasishta of Kakabashundi, who was an enlightened crow who supposedly lived for you know eons of time and so on. But that's an aside. But um, well, I think what we're asking is if how do we def let's say how do we define awakening or how do we define enlightenment? And to the best of my ability to explain it, we would define that as um, having gained conscious uh, access to the ground state of all existence, uh, having realized that um, one is not 
merely this sort of individual expression which the vast majority of people take themselves to be but that one actually is that sort of universal field of, of consciousness of energy and intelligence and creativity which underlies and gives rise to the whole universe everything is plugged into that everything is grounded in that just as all light bulbs are plugged into the electric field um, but not everything um, uh, is equally aware of that connection or of that ultimate uh, reality of one's existence. Uh, most, the vast majority are not. And it seems to me that it's rather rare, or perhaps becoming less so these days, for any being, and generally we speak of human beings, to have that that level of consciousness, that degree of, of awareness. It's, it's usually considered to have been, you know, something that only a handful in any generation has been privy to, but these days it seems to be becoming more common. Um, so anyway, that would be my nutshell definition of what we mean by awakening or enlightenment. And can we can we really say that my dog has that a level of awakening or is capable of it? There's there's where I get skeptical. Uh, but but you. my dog yes. is a beautiful being and yes. is co and yes. is is ultimately functioning from that that same uh, level of intelligence, that same level of awareness, but is the dog conscious of it? That's, that's is the, the dog conscious of their experience? Yeah, that's right. the, the crux of the question. And yes, thank you. My experience is that how I will define awakening in this moment now, which might have nothing to do with yesterday or one minute from now, truly, mm -hmm. is that there is awareness in the universe permeating through beings. And in that awareness is a complete, there's no word for it, there's a completeness of all beings are vibrating and each one is a microphone of each of the others with consciousness of each of the others floating through the being. So I'm one being speaking. My experience is that animals are fully aware of the universal consciousness that they are, of the personal consciousness that they are, or the animal, I should say, consciousness that they are, in this moment now, that so many a person comes seeking. There's nothing to seek. It is right here. This complete connectedness among all beings is speaking through each of us. It's permeating in every cell, and every animal I meet is fully aware of that and humans many humans are seeking to remember this okay so you're saying essentially that every animal is aware of, of that pure awareness that permeates everything and that we're all it's like it's like you know we're all like fish in the ocean of that swimming around but uh so animals are fish which realize that they are in this ocean, that they are this ocean, whereas human beings have somehow lost that awareness and are looking for the ocean. Yes, and that animals have a, a, seem to have a built-in humility to recognize their independent role within that as given rather than something the mind constructs. So an animal's heart knows for this particular time my role is compassion or my role is joy whereas a human it can get very busy constructing an, a title or an identity to appear to be something that isn't naturally what's trying to birth forth through them so would you say this is true of all animals or just uh, certain animals do you do you kind of draw the line at a certain point where that might no longer be true this is a good question I asked myself many times because I wondered, well, am I just getting clients as animals because they were attracted to each other and were speaking a similar language, or what's the whole story? My, I, my guess is that a much larger percentage of animals live in a very awake state than people Rarely do I meet an animal that's been hurt or wounded enough to retreat from that, but occasionally I do. Often I meet a human that's been completely removed from that for now until something shifts within them. 
Yeah. So, I mean, let's keep playing with this. So, yeah. I mean, we could kind of go down the so-called evolutionary scale I mean, and, and see if there's a point at which you would say, okay, let's cut it off here. I mean, are, are frogs, you know, uh, aware of, uh, of the oh. pure or are, or, 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 you know, snails or, um, you know, paramecia, um, whatever the plural of that is. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, is, are you, is there a certain... Uh, section of the animal kingdom spectrum which would fit the description you've offered uh, or would you would you not draw the line any place well bees taught me that I could turn pain into ecstasy and don't misunderstand because I'm not into sadism, masochism or anything like that at all mm -hmm. but I did um, get taught by the bees because I would let the bees crawl on my hand and we'd hang out and they wouldn't sting me and one day I walked up the hill and I was just disconnected from myself complaining to myself and I got a little sting and I asked what what's up because that hasn't been the way we've been cooperating you know we've been hanging out each morning and the bee just helped me to understand that I was to tune so deeply into that pain that I felt that the vibration turned into ecstasy and please don't misconstrue this anyone I'm not saying to go put yourself in pain or no, this is not my thing but <laughs> <laughs> but but I learned that I could be in a creative process through surrender with vibration so that what I thought was bad wasn't and what I thought was pain wasn't and pain was really resistance it changed my whole understanding of the universe around so insects I see I have a lot of relationship with insects I have all kinds of stories to tell you about insects Lucy the beetle knocks on the door literally she has taken her body and we hear a knock she bangs her body on the door and we open it and she comes in and she hangs out with us we have photographs she likes to spend time with us and she tends to come around when there's about to be a big birth and I I feel that um, the insects are very intelligent. They've taught me so much about manifestation in terms of vibration, and they've helped me to uh, come into much different states of, of, of vibration, of light vibration, mm -hmm. from their awareness. I mean, they come over and they talk. I'm trying to remember the book that was written by someone who had a relationship with a fly. He was the trainer, I think, for a very famous dog on TV. Hmm. And he shocked people. And this is an old book, many decades back. Someone listening will know the title of it. It got really well known. But no, I would not divide beings up among species because just like you can go to the bus stop and you might have an enlightened person and someone who's a criminal about to kill people. And they, if you, oh, those are just two people. It's the same with animals. You can have animals in very different experiences but what is very humbling what the animals have taught me because I was recently speaking to a family with a bunch of dogs and cats and I noticed a judgment come up in my mind when they were telling me well this animal's purpose is just to be loved and have everyone else like him and this one is holding a space of divine mother in my mind was like wow and the hierarchy uh, reasoning emerged in my mind. I watched it. Oh, that one's just more evolved. And the animals told me, no, we're just each doing our role. Can you see it in another way? And I thought, wow, can I see all humans in another way? That each one and each animal is just doing their role. That there is no judge. And you said no judgmental. I heard that. There is no hierarchy. So the hierarchy you're speaking of really has to do with uh, what it, what it can intelligence do with different vehicles, different kinds of beings. It's not worse or better. I hear that. And we don't know because we don't even know who we are, let alone the animals are. We just know we use such a small percentage of who we are. And we don't know that the animals are only using a small percentage because we, we barely know animals. We're only starting to discover the intelligence and awareness of animals. So I would say let's keep it as a question. Okay, but I want to come back at you one more time because I love it. I love it. <laughs> <Go for> it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think we would all agree, or at least both agree, that um, animals are obviously a very, um, very much attuned to nature. You know, to to nature's intelligence. They're yes. just innocent expressions of that. I mean, we're all sense organs of the infinite, uh, but human beings are rather rebellious sense organs. Animals don't go into movie theaters and shoot people up. Animals don't, uh, you know, kill for the fun of it. Yes. They, in fact, I've seen pictures of of you know tiger or leopards or some big cats like just nuzzling and playing with a little deer because they weren't hungry. You know the Although our cat would take exception to that. She goes and kills mice that she doesn't want to eat. Uh, but in any case, animals don't have this sort of 
perverse cruelty that the human race has displayed. Yeah. And, and so it's very easy to sort of think of animals as enlightened. Yeah. Um, and, um, but I would say, that, and in, the, in a similar sense, it's very easy to think of little babies as enlightened. You know, we see a little baby and they're just so pure and innocent and present and, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. And, you know, they, they don't have the, oh, there you go. <laughs> this is Jess, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> nice one. Um, so, you know, it's very, and it's very easy to interpret that innocence. Hey, Jesse. Um, that innocence as being a, a, an enlightened state uh, because innocence and spontaneity and attunement with nature are actually characteristics of the enlightened state. Uh, but I would say that there is another dimension to the enlightened state as traditionally defined, which um, is not shared by animals and babies, um, which is this complete self-referral quality where uh, the, you know the consciousness, which uh, you know is the part, is the ultimate substance of the universe, has fully woken up to its own nature. Um, the, uh, wh when that happens, there is an animal-like or or baby-like you know simplicity. Christ says you know be as little children, uh, but it's it's sort of the it's the it's the other shore and. And on this shore, you, you have animals displaying innocence, displaying spontaneity, uh, not be doing all the perverse things that people do. Um, but I don't think, and this is where we fundamentally differ, that in the, that, that their physical structure, their nervous system, or their, their soul maturity is um, going to support that complete self-referral awareness that um, is defined as enlightenment, the, the sort of the universe finally waking up to itself, at least in that particular expression. You know, you know, the, yes. you know what I'm saying? I hear you and I think you're, you, you keep getting at a part of the human brain which is witnessing itself. Is that correct? Um, what I'm saying I think is that the human brain can, has the capacity to allow the intelligence which created it and, the, and which created the whole universe to finally know itself in fullness in within a, in, a human within a human in, to, to make to, for that to become a living reality yes um, you know, I don't the, see any reason why that can't be the case with an animal or an ant, insect or a tree and I'm assuming with many of them it already is hmm. so we just we just disagree and that's totally fine because we really don't know. Nobody knows. But no, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's something. We, uh, yeah, I don't think it's something we could prove one way <laughs> yeah, or the other. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, I think we've we've chewed on that enough to, and given people plenty to to think about. Um, I'm not sure we could. Uh, maybe if we revisited this a couple of years from now. Yeah, we we'd be yeah. able to see, yeah see where we had gotten with this. Uh, the cat's the president by then. <laughs> Yeah, not not a bad. Idea. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and I'll grant you that the ability to uh, create to send men to the moon or um, you know smash the atom and all that are not necessarily uh, correlates of any kind of enlightened consciousness, um, but they do signify a, a a much more complete expression. Of. Or an expression that within the context of what humanity is trying to create, once again, we don't know the complexity and the fullness of the expression that the animal tribes, the animals, who's lasted on the planet for a long time, the ants, by working together in community, they come up with ways that by working together in community, they can survive longer. That takes a lot of intelligence. Yeah, no. And, and actually, one more thing that comes to mind, which is, you know, when you say intelligence, I, you know, I'm just always thrilled. I love watching things on uh, the Discovery Channel and things like that, where you see animals doing stuff, or you look, they'll have some documentary on what's going on inside of a cell. And the reason I love it is that it's just like, it's like God, you know, on display. The, there's this profound intelligence that is so obviously functioning in all those things. 
you know, who could who could say that it's dumb billiard balls running into each other? I mean, it's just brimming with intelligence, you know. I think that's such an important point that we're coming back around to because we're speaking of intelligence and consciousness and capacities of different species, but of course, where it all comes from, it comes from one energy that has orchestrated and designed and continues to evolve all of this. Key point, to evolve. And so what is the purpose of this evolution? You know, what, what is this intelligence trying to accomplish, if, it is, if we can think of it in anthropomorphic terms, that it's actually trying to accomplish something? It seems that what it's trying to do is to evolve more and more sophisticated expressions. You know, when we started out with, let's say, the Big Bang, and at, the, at that point, you know, very few elements even. There couldn't be animals, there couldn't be humans because there weren't the building blocks to make them. And so eventually we, we, came, we had stars and then within stars heavier elements were produced from uh, I guess it was hydrogen. And, uh, th and you know, our bodies are actually made up of the uh, byproducts of stars. That's where the, all the elements that, that enable life to exist have come from. And so that there seems to be this direction or purpose that has been going on for billions and billions of years and it seems to be going somewhere um, and so you know is a, is a, a mosquito or a sand crab the final destination or is it just a fairly rudimentary expression of this intelligence and we can see even more sophisticated expressions um, coexisting on our planet now and there may be you know other planets where expressions far beyond you know, anything we can imagine here exist. Uh, so I'm getting a little long-winded here, but uh, I'm kind of saying that if we think of not only biological evolution as the, as the um, purpose of creation, ultimately, but, the, but that the purpose of biological evolution is the um, ability for the intelligence which created the universe to express itself and, and to experience through these, you know, sense organs that we call, you know, animals and, and human beings, that, that the more sophisticated the instrument, the more interesting that expression can be, the more complete that expression can be. And that ultimately, the, the um, Maybe not ultimately. Maybe ultimate is too fine a, final a word. But but that uh, this whole thing of enlightenment or spiritual awakening is very significant in that when it occurs for the first time in the billions of years of evolution, that consciousness comes to know itself. There's a T.S. Eliot poem about coming back to where we started from and knowing the place for the first time. My experience in this moment now is that there's a beautiful, benevolent love light out of which we are speaking and all is being born, and there's a free will, there's an agreement that if something sophisticated wishes to replicate itself into more and more sophistication, for a certain time period that will be allowed. All is fleeting and each form will be born and die. But for a certain period that will be allowed. If something simple wishes to replicate itself, whether that's a life form or an idea or a society, that too will be given permission for a time period, all comes and goes, to replicate itself. My experience is awakening and enlightenment would have little to do with how complex it is or how simple it is and that an awareness of love will birth itself forward in a full awakening in many different perspectives through many different glasses in many different ways throughout time. Huh. Um, so you're saying that awakening or enlightenment um, does not require a sophisticated expression, a sophisticated nervous system, um, as certain things do require it. I mean, speech and and the conceptual thinking, uh, the ability to do mathematics, and so on. Those things require a sophisticated nervous system, a sophisticated brain. Um, but you're saying that enlightenment or awakening do not necessarily require one. 
Yes, and also we have made assumptions that physical size in the brain, and I didn't hear you say this, I'm just bringing it up, would be an indication of the sophistication of a brain, and now it's being proven that's actually not true, that certain species are considered to have higher IQs with smaller brains, and I think as time goes on and more and more scientists and anthropologists are stepping forward to study different species of animals, it will be shown that the IQ of animals is far greater than what we have thought. So so you're saying that elephants and chimps and dolphins and whales who have the larger brains are, don't necessarily have higher IQs than animals with smaller brains? I would say not necessarily. I, I would say I wouldn't make that assumption. Huh. I would leave as much open as a question as possible. So if we ask the question, how can awakening occur, any being asking that question most likely delves deep in it, deeper into that possibility. Like you said, if we ask for something or we seek for something, there's a chance that grace will come and assist us with that, or if we avail ourselves, give ourselves to something. Mm -hmm. So if we give ourselves to the question, how can love take over all that is? The answer might come, and within that, the answer to the full enlightenment state into which the mind categorizes enlightenment, which to me isn't necessarily a requirement for anything, will assist. So that's, that's my reply. Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing because I could go on all day doing this. It's just the way my mind works. Each thing, what someone says, brings up a new question. The new question here would be, you know, can we even ask that question without a sophisticated nervous system? <laughs> well, we, can ask, we can ask, and what I invite people listening to ask is, what is their experience here now? What are you experiencing? And can you give your love so fully to that, that it answers something, that it becomes something, or that you find out what happens? I'm inviting people to give themselves so fully to what is in their heart in this moment now, that wherever that wishes to take them occurs. Good. And that's a good point to end on. It's, you know, all this intellectual ping pong is, you know, interesting, but I think it really comes down to what you just said. I'm so happy I got to talk to you. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And I yeah. love your, your, your very smart and lively mind and that you would engage with me in that kind of a dialogue. I really enjoyed it, and I thank you so much. And to be able to share this with people out there is a great blessing. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Let me make a, just a couple of concluding remarks. Um, you have been listening to or watching an interview with Dr. Lori Moore, um, and you probably know that by now if you've gotten this far in the interview, but just to say it in conclusion. And this interview is one of an ongoing series. I believe it's number 131 in the series, and um, there's a new one each week. So if you'd like to listen to more of them, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and there you'll see them all archived. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you could go to the YouTube channel and you'll see them all archived. And on the YouTube channel, if you subscribe to the channel, you get notified every time a new one gets posted. Or if you're at batgap.com, there's a little tab at the top where you can click and sign up to be notified by email every time a new one is posted. There's also a link on batgap.com to the podcast in case you'd prefer to listen to this as an audio podcast rather than watch it as a video. So you'll see that there. Also uh, there you'll see a, a bio of Lori and a link to her website through which you can contact her if you wish. Um, there's also a little discussion group that crops up around each interview. I have a feeling that this one will be a lively one. <laughs> <laughs> that some of them have had as many as 500 uh, <laughs> posts, and uh, but they all get, uh, they're all sort of interesting. And uh, I would request, but not demand, but you know, humbly request that try to keep the discussion relevant to what is being discussed in each particular interview. And there's a general comments tab that you can click if you just want to make general comments or post cute YouTube videos of your favorite musician or whatever. Then there's that for that. Um, also, there's a donate button, and uh, I haven't mentioned this in quite a while, but perhaps that's the reason why donations have slowed up a little bit. So if you feel like making a donation to help support this, click on the button and it takes you to a PayPal thing. So thanks for listening or watching. Thank you again, Lori. Thank you. 
And uh, next week I'll be speaking to uh, Francis Bennett, who spent the good part of his adult life in Trappist monasteries and had a very profound um, awakening not too long ago. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that conversation as well. So thanks again, and we'll see you next week.